part of this. Okay. So welcome everybody. Um, I think you only have one thing, one thing left to do, and that's the uh, finish the finish the project and make a PowerPoint presentation of it. And that is due December 6th on Sunday at mid midnight. And that's the last thing you need to do for this class. Uh, but please, if you have any questions about it, uh, please, please let me know. Um, you know, it's going to be graded not just on, on the, um, uh, on the circuit that, that you make, it's also on the presentation of, of, the, uh, of the poster. Think of the poster as a story, that you're trying to tell a story to somebody. And so, someone who has maybe a little bit of uh, technical knowledge, but is not, um, doesn't have too much knowledge in, in electronics. Okay, so let's see. Does anybody have any questions right now before, before we start with the, uh, the, the last lecture, which is uh, uh, some, some modern technology and some future uh, electronics. I have a question. Sure, yeah. What exactly do you mean by a story? Um, well, um, okay, usually a po if you have a poster session, I think maybe I don't know if many of the students have come to the um, Rise uh, poster session at, um, at Northeastern, but you know people come by, they'll take a look at it. That if they if it's in a subject they're interested in, they'll they'll certainly stop and see it. But if they're only a little bit interested or don't know exactly what um, what the poster is about, they they they'll. You know, you have to have something eye-catching, for example, to start with. Um, and then the, the thing about a story is um, it, it should progress um, along a certain, um, a, a certain set of things. You have to have a beginning, a middle, and, and an end. Sometimes an abstract, um, the data and analysis, and then, and then, a, then a summary. So um, you, when, when you're doing any presentation or report, um, often you think when you're writing a report, yeah, I'm, I'm writing this for me, but it's never for you. It's for somebody else. You're always writing for somebody else. So you have an audience. And that's what I mean by a story. When, it, when you're telling a story, you're telling a story to somebody else. Um, you're presenting it to somebody else. So, so kind of that's what I mean by a story, that you have to imagine that the other person may, you know, may not know what, what, you're, what, you're, what you're talking about in, in some ways. So, so you have to give them a nice introduction and so on. So what I mean by story is that, you know, you have to focus on who is going to be looking at it. And, and what you want them to get out, out of it. Not from just the point of view of what, I'm, what I have done. That's, that's a mistake, uh, you know, that, that everybody, everybody makes is, you know, I've, I've been to a number of uh, PhD thesis um, presentations and students always wanna put everything that they've ever done in, in a talk and it just, Never, it never works. It never works. You have to, you have to come at it um, from the audience's point of view. Any other questions? Let's see. I'm using a totally different computer now, so you may. You have to bear with me for some of it. Okay, get rid of that. Um, can you move this up? Yeah, there we go. Move it up there.
Okay, so I'd like to give you a little bit of background on, on memories and logic, mostly, mostly about memories, about um, the current technology of, of computer memories and um, you know, some, some future aspects of memories and logic devices. Um, and one of the things is we're, that I'm particularly interested in that uh, my, my research is, is concerned with is using the magnetic properties of the electron. And we call that spintronics and, and we'll get to that. <clears throat> and I'm not, I'm not an expert on quantum computers or neuromorphic computing, but I just thought I'd put that in at the end um, with a little bit of information that you might, you might wanna go into a little further yourself. Okay, the internet requires huge amounts of non-volatile memory. Non-volatile memory is memory that, uh, you know, will, will, will stay on your computer when you, when you turn it off, basically. Um, there are other kinds of memory that your, your computer uses a lot of other kinds of memory that, that are volatile, that, that go away as soon, as soon as you turn it off. So when, when, you, when you think of the internet and the World Wide Web, how much memory we're using? Um, the World Wide Web has billions of index pages, billions. And um, in terms of data pages, that, that's even more. And if you, if you look at the, uh, the amount of uh, gigabytes of, uh, of information, um, that information would, uh, is equivalent to holding 10 to the 13th movies, because there's approximately five uh, gigabytes uh, in, a, in a movie. Um, energy usage, it uses about 10% of the uh, world's electricity. And about half of that is just for cooling um, these data centers. And then it takes some information to transfer data for electricity, just for transferring a movie over the internet, it's, it's roughly about 10 cents. Okay, things are getting better all the time. The energy efficiency doubles every, every roughly two years. Um, and the energy goes into not only energy of use, usage of the internet, but uh, into when you have to figure out, you have to figure what the, the energy that goes into manufacturing, manufacturing computers and, and uh, data centers. I mean, here's, here's a picture of Google server farm. Um, they have these, these all over the world and they're, they're, they're essentially a lot of computers, but you can think of them as just a lot of storage device. There, there's a lot of storage devices, thousands and thousands of them in, in, in one building. And here's, here's roughly the, uh, uh, the breakdown of the, the, uh, the amount of power per gigabit of, of uh, gigabyte of information in data centers, uh, end users, that's us, and in transportation, that's getting between the data centers and back and forth. So when you're looking at something in Google, um, it takes, you know, it can take just as little as a second to get that, that information to you. Okay, so we're all the time looking at, uh, looking at small, at, at higher and higher density of memory. Um, so that means you have to get things smaller and smaller to store them in a smaller and smaller space. Uh, here's something, um, magnetic uh, tape cassette, the Sony Walkman. It came out uh, 40, 40 years ago. Uh, it's shown in this movie here, Guardians of the Galaxy, which came out, uh, I guess more, more than, a little more than five years ago. It would hold 12 songs, okay? And it was, a, it was a magnetic tape cassette. Essentially, it was magnetic storage, um, just like your hard drive, except it was on a, a Mylar tape. And then, then along came uh, the CD player. Uh, the CD player is not magnetic, it, it's optical, but it'll, it holds uh, many, many more songs. And with compression, you can almost get a, um, uh, get a gig gigabyte on it. Uh, and then along came the hard disk drive. 
And that's where Spintronics came in to be able the, look at the look at the size of the uh, hard disk drive. That's just a tiny little thing that's inside of the iPod, and so the amount of storage you could get was now a thousand songs on something that that you could carry uh, carry with you. So um, let's take a look at the science behind uh, memory devices, non volatile memories. Um, we have hard disk drives. Uh, which is a rotating magnetic disk. And we also have solid state drives. Uh, the one thing is uh, there's a big difference in price right now, uh, but it's getting smaller. That most of the information uh, in the world is stored on, on hard disk drives. It's a rotating magnetic disk. So there's little magnetic bits that have north and south um, pointing magnetic moments that can be stored and read. Whereas a solid state drive, it's essentially a NAND gate. You can store a piece of information in a, in a simple transistor. It has no moving parts. I mean, it looks, it looks like this. Whereas a hard disk drive has, has a motor in and a, uh, and a stylus that, that move, moves across it. Um, here's, a, here's a picture I found on, on the internet. Here's a Here's one of the first uh, hard, hard drives. Uh, it's in what we call a clean room. A clean room is some place that has um, almost no particles floating around in the air to land on something and, and make it dirty and not, not function. And this is 1975. So in it took them 30 years to get, get a, a factor of a thousand increase in the, in the density of uh, of a hard disk drive. But this thing was, you can see, is about a, a meter in, in diameter. I mean, now I, I, look, I looked it up. Uh, you can get a two terabyte hard drive for about 50 bucks. And you can, uh, so here's, so here's uh, the disk in, in, a hard, in a hard drive here. And it's, it's traveling at about uh, 80, 80 miles an hour. It's 100 revolutions per second. And then it has various, uh, various sectors and tracks where it can store, store information and be read off these different, different tracks. Because this stylus here can move back and forth across, across the various tracks. And then in the the higher density hard drives, they have just a number of these things, uh, one on top of each other. Like here's a picture of, uh, of four uh, platters, four disks in, in one hard drive. Okay, so the, the basic uh, function of a hard drive is, is that it has, it has a magnetic layer and on each track, you can have you can have north south pointing one way or pointing the other way, and then you have a, essentially an uh, electromagnet that can magnetize and, and um, store the data on the disk, and then you also have some sort of device that can read uh, read the data. So if you want to get higher and higher density, you have to make each one of these uh, bits smaller and smaller. Okay, and then what they found out was that um, you, could, you can have the north-south magnets lying longitudinally along the track like this, but then when you start making them uh, really small, they become too small. So if, the, if a magnet is too small, then just thermal energy can flip its, uh, flip its direction and um, essentially randomize, randomize the data. So what they, what they did was they, they said, well, instead of having the magnetic moment uh, in a longitudinal direction, they can make it in a perpendicular direction and make them longer, make them long enough so that they have, they have enough magnetic moment that the uh, thermal excitations won't, won't flip them. So now we have a uh, perpendicular recording and then they, they can make them, make the bits smaller that way takes up less, spite, less space, so you have an increase in what we call the aerial density, the, the area density.
and this is just an illustration here that if you, if you want to make a bit a certain width here, then you have to make it long in some direction such, such that it has enough magnetic moment. Okay, I wanted to show you this. Here, here's a picture of the, of the surface of a, of a hard drive. And each, each one of these little dots is, uh, is a nanoparticle is a magnetic nanoparticle. <clears throat> and it's about five nanometers in diameter. And it's, uh, it's expensive stuff. It's made out of iron platinum. Platinum is about $1,000 per ounce. So it's, it's about half the, half the price of gold, but you don't, you don't need much thickness here on, on a disc. The thickness can be um, 100 nanometers or, or even smaller. Okay, so you have all these little magnetic bits in here, sorry, these, these are magnetic nanoparticles, but a magnetic bit is going to, is going to encompass a, a lot of these, okay? You, um, it's pretty hard to make um, each one of these man, magnetic nanoparticles addressable, that is leave it, you know, be able to find it, okay, and know, and know where it is. So, so a, ma a bit, of information in a uh, in a hard drive would would be a would be something that's on the order of say this 50 nanometers so it would be it would be a pretty pretty large area and it would encompass you know 20 or 30 uh, magnetic nanoparticles and th this is just to point out that if you have magnetic nanoparticles and you just throw them down on on a disk they're going to line up in lines because north and south is going to are going to be paired so north goes to south of the next one and so on so what what they had to do the technology was was uh, was fairly difficult that they had to take each one of these nanoparticles magnetic nanoparticles of iron platinum and surround them by an insulator silicon dioxide silicon dioxide so that keeps them away from each other so the magnetic field of one doesn't affect the magnetic field of an adjacent one Okay. Otherwise, you get chains like this. Uh, any questions on on those kind of hard drives so far? So all of the trillions of gigabytes of information is stored on these, those kinds of hard drives, almost strictly by, on those kinds of hard drives. Okay, now we have <coughs> solid state uh, memory. Okay, no moving parts, well, that's great. Um, ac accessing the information uh, is, is faster, roughly four times faster. It has lower power than, than a hard disk drive but it's still more expensive. It used to be about five times more expensive um, just a year or two ago, but now the, the price has dropped a little bit. So uh, it's about a factor of four different. So it's a couple hundred bucks for um, two terabytes of, uh, of this. And you can see it's written on here, NAND. V um, for maybe non-volatile. And then NAND, it's just a NAND uh, gate. Okay, it's, called, it's all, also called flash memory. And you can see the bit size here is, is, is pretty small. So they're, they're making transistors that are on the order of 10 nanometers in size, 10 nanometers. They're made of MOSFET transistors. And here, here is how that works. So here's a um, here's a an FET, a MOSFET. It's a field effect transistor, but it's a metal oxide. So there's an insulator here, and an insulator here. That's the metal oxide. Is the oxides are generally insulators. So in the NAND type, you have you have two gates. You have a control gate and a floating gate. And the way it works is is that you know, if you, if you put an electric field here, it can drive electrons in or out of this end channel 
and make the conduction from one side from the source to the drain. Here's the source, here's the drain. So you can change the resistance of this thing by how many electrons are in between. And you can change that by putting a voltage or electric field on the, on the gate. But the way this works is they have, this is a control gate here, but this is a floating gate here. So if they put a voltage on the top gate, they can create a bunch of electrons and, and those will be stored in the floating gate. And those electrons will say repel the electrons in this channel and make it instant making the source to drain resistance high or turn it off basically. And that charge that <clears throat> is on the floating gate will, um, will stay there for years, many years. So essentially they've, they, they've made a transistor, an FET, that, uh, that can just hold its charge for, for many, many years. And that, that's how uh, the information is stored in these uh, flash memories. And then you can, you can clear it or, you know, you can basically, you can take, put charge on the floating gate or you can take it off with a, with a control gate here. Okay, so that's how flash memory works. And I think um, Samsung in, uh, in Korea is one of the, one of the largest, been lo one of the largest makers of, uh, of this type of memory for, for many, many years. Any questions on, on those kind of memories at all? We'd like to use solid state memories, but it's just too expensive. If, if you have, if you have a, uh, a server farm someplace in Finland that's storing, uh, you know, all this Google data, and you say, well, you know, I, I need uh, 10,000 hard drives. Well, do you, wanna, do you want the hard drives uh, for cheap, four times cheaper than solid state drives? Of course you do. It'd just be too expensive. Okay, let's, let's take a look at the science behind what we call spintronics. Spintronics relies on the, the quantum nature of electrons, okay? Okay, we all know elect, uh, an electron has a mass, right? It has a charge. And basically all, almost all of our electronics that we've used up until, let's say 30 years ago was, was built on charge is built on charge, but it also has angular momentum, spin. Electron is a spin a half. It has, um, it has, it has a uh, one half um, um, unit of angular momentum. And you can think of it, um, this is, this is uh, overly simplified because it's, it's not really true. You can think of it as any time you have a moving charge, right? Maxwell's equation tells you you have a magnetic field. So if this charged electron spins, then it has a magnetic moment. Okay, uh, it doesn't work out if you do the math. If 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 you assume this a good value for the the size of the electron and the magnetic moment, um, you know. It, it, it just, it's not physical. It's another way to think of it as, I mean, certainly you're thinking, thinking of it as, you know, a charge, is, a charge is moving, so you get a magnetic field, okay? And it has a one unit of, um, called a Bohr magneton, which is a magnetic moment. Okay, well, good enough. Well, how, how, do you, how do you make devices out of this? How do, you, how do you utilize that magnetic moment of the electron? Well, first of all, all magnetism has to do with the, uh, um, the, the magnetic moment of an electron. You wouldn't have any magnet, um, well, permanent magnet. Uh, you can have electromagnets, but in any, any permanent magnet 
is magnetized because the electrons are lined up in a certain direction. Okay. But how do you use how do you use that in electronics? Well, okay. I, I sure a number of you have heard about Richard Feynman, one of the one of the greatest uh, uh, physics teachers, I would say. Um, very, very interesting character. He's written a number of, of, uh, of, of books about his, his life um, that are very, very interesting to read. He's, he's also made a whole series of uh, called Feynman Lectures, which he's looking at physics, just, you know, physics one, two, in a, in a, looking at it a little bit different way. Well, 1959, um, he, Wow, um, 60 years ago, he, he, uh, he gave a talk at the American Physical Society. That's the main physical society for physics. And the, the uh, title of the talk was, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And I think that the title came about because he was thinking that, okay, if you, you can go down in temperature, right? You can go down to, you know, zero degrees C, you can go down to one degree Kelvin, you can go down to a milli Kelvin, you can go down to a micro Kelvin, you know, it's, it's a philosophy like that, that you can split things, you can, you can go down a whole lot um, in, in temperature, but also in size, in size. So here's some of the uh, pictures of, of his notes for that talk. And here's some quotes that he envisioned uh, his listeners. He challenged us. He would, he would often challenge people. He would have, he would have uh, contests on who can make the smallest motor and, you know, give a prize of a certain amount of money or something. Uh, anyway, so um, the uh, DNA was isolated many years ago in the 1800s. Uh, Watson, Crick, and Franklin um, determined the structure of DNA, notice it was made out of base pairs. Um, uh, 2001, the human genome was, was, uh, was mapped out. But he said, you know, in the future, we're going to sequence the bases of DNA. And now, you, now we have machines, you put a little bit of DNA in it, comes out with a computer um, printout of, uh, of, of all the base pairs. Um, I guess there, there are also machines that, uh, you know, that'll, that'll put these things together and it'll make strands of proteins and things that you, you tell it to make. So he was ahead of his time on that one. Uh, miniaturizing computers with wires 10 to 100 atoms in diameter. Well, we're not quite down to 10, but we're, we're less than 100 atoms in diameter. The, uh, the, the size of wires that we can make. Uh, a microscope that could see individual atoms. Well, okay. Um, it eight years later, the, tra the uh, transmission electron microscope uh, was able to um, image atoms. In 1981, the scanning tunneling microscope was made. Essentially, that's just a, that's just a, like a needle on a, old time phonograph uh, scanning across something. And it, as it scans, it can, it can, see, uh, it can see atoms. Uh, machines to maneuver things atom by atom, a scanning tunneling microscope can do that. You can pick up an atom and move it. And here, the very last thing, he also said that systems involving, he envisioned systems involving quantized energy levels Okay, quantized energy levels. Well, uh, a laser, a laser pointer, a, a laser um, has, operates because it has quantized energy levels. LEDs, LEDs have quantized energy levels. That's how come an LED has a certain color that we learned in the, uh, in the course. And then the interaction of quantized spins. I mean, I don't know what he meant by that, but, uh, you know, certainly the interaction of quantized spins, well, that's a quantum computer.
Okay, so so the, the, the point is, he was thinking of what, what are we going to do in the future? And he envisioned all these things. He envisioned all these things. Any questions so far? Okay. One of the problems in reading, um, in reading small bits on a hard drive, how do you read magnetic bits as they travel at these high speeds? Okay. Um, okay, you could, you could read a magnetic bit uh, if you had like a horseshoe piece of iron or something. And as a magnetic bit came by, it would put magnetic flux in this thing in this horseshoe, and then you could read out a current from a coil around it. Well, you can't make these things too small. That's the big problem. So instead, uh, what Spintronics um, was able to do is make something called a magneto-resistive device. Magneto, meaning a magnetic field, can cause a change in resistance. So, so here's, here's a, an image here. These two brownish pieces here are, say, copper metal, and then this device in the center. So you're measuring, you put a voltage across this and measure a current, you can measure the resistance of this, of this little device. So as, as each magnetic bit goes by, if it's pointing in one direction or the other, it measures a change in resistance. And you can measure that change in resistance electrically uh, quite easily. And that, that's what led to making higher density uh, recording in hard drives. Okay, so the, so once you had this magneto resistance material, um, it was first used in the Sony Walkman. Okay, you could make a, a hard drive very, very small if you could, if you could do that. Um, and then there's something called magnetic tunnel junction, uh, which I'll explain later, but it's, it's, a, it's a sandwich of two pieces of, of uh, magnetic material with a, a, an insulator between them. But this insulator is so thin, it's only um, about one and a half nanometers thick, that electrons can quantum mechanically tunnel from one side to the other. So it's really using quantum quantum mechanics. So in this case, um, you make this sandwich here and you make it so that, that one ferromagnet is always pointing in one direction, but then you make the other magnet weaker so that as a magnetic field comes by, it can flip the magnetic moment direction of this one pointing up or pointing down, depending on um, what the bit is that comes by. So that this device is inside here, right above this, uh, um, this, this hard drive disk, okay? So this is a magneto-resistive device. And you can see here that here's how the resistance changes with magnetic field. Um, Here's a value here and it goes up um, when, it, when it sees a magnetic, when a magnetic bit is reversed, um, the resistance goes up a factor of, you know, doubles. And it depends on which direction the magnetic field is in. So you can see the magnetic field, um, it, 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 can, it can read 50 gauss, 50 gauss of magnetic field. Um, that's, it can, it can do much better than that now, but this is, the, this is one I could find uh, easily. Okay, so this is a magnetic tunnel junction. If you have a hard drive in your computer, um, that's what it's using to read it. Okay. So just in terms of history, the first magneto-resistive device was uh, here and uh, it was made of a very thin, it wasn't a tunneling device per se, but it was a, 
it was a device where um, it had magneto resistance. And uh, a German and a, and a Frenchman received the Nobel Prize for it in uh, 2007. Then they found out that something better was a magnetic tunnel junction. And it has this fixed layer and this free layer and this, and this quantum mechanical tunneling barrier be between them. So when these two, when these two um, magnetic moments are oppositely um, pointing, you get a high resistance state. And when they're pointing in the same direction, you get a low resistance state. So when you're trying to measure a magnetic field or, or, look, or just see when a magnetic field is there and is changing, if you can flip this, what's called free layer here, you go from a, you flip this arrow over to this one, you go from a high resistance state to a low resistance state. And this is, this is one of my uh, collaborators at MIT who discovered it. Uh, he, he got the 2009, it's called the Buckley Prize, which is the highest American prize in physics. And he came, the interesting part is he came by one day, um, with uh, two of his summer uh, high school students, high school students, mind you. And he, he wanted me to, to witness um, his patent application, okay? So I, I signed it and there were five, he put five people on the, uh, on the patent application and I think two of them were high school students, okay? And they, they each got a couple million dollars when when this, uh, when this thing was sold. So anyway, there's, there's hope for everyone. I think that's an interest, interesting thing that even a high school student can, uh, can participate in something so, so great, yeah. Okay, and here's, just, here's, here's, here's what it looks like. Uh, on the arm of this thing that's that's reading the uh, the disk drive, um, and there's a little tiny sensor on the end of this wire. It's very very small, and it can, it's going to read the, uh, the the magnetic bit along there. So as the as as the information goes by underneath this uh, this this reader, um, then you get you get positive or negative pulses of, of electricity. Okay, any, any questions about uh, hard drives, uh, solid state drives, magnetic tunnel junction? Am I being heard? Can somebody say something? We can yeah, hear you. you. Okay, great, great. All right. Yeah. Uh, and you'll see that the magnetic tunnel junction is good for other things too. Uh, nobody realized that when, uh, when it was being discovered. Okay, so we, we know that you can, with spintronics, you can make something that measures the magnetic field but you can also make a solid state memory out of it. Okay, so take a look here. Um, here's different, different, kinds, of, different kinds of memories. Um, uh, SRAM, DRAM, RAM is uh, random access memory. Uh, flash drive, which we just talked about, like the uh, SSD. Uh, don't worry about what that one is. Um, and then there's uh, MRAM, which is, which is magnetic RAM, magnetic RAM. You can see it has non-volatile properties and flash. So it has, it's non-volatile. Okay, so this is what's in uh, flash memories in solid state drives. And this one could still be better, but as, as yet the, the technology is still um, quite a ways away. Um, it's better for some things. It, ha it has 
um, the scalability and the, the, the write speed is very fast. Okay, so we can measure a magnetic field with a magnetic tunnel junction. Uh, can we make a memory out of it? A magnetic RAM, MRAM. Um, so here's, so it's, uh, you have the same sort of structure. You have two magnetic layers. Mind you, these layers are very thin. These layers only need to be, um, you know, tens of nanometers thick. And then, uh, and then um, it has the tunnel barrier in between them. So remember, you have the high resistance state when the two arrows are pointing in opposite directions and low resistance state when they're pointing in the same direction. So here you have, this could be a logic one, a bit of memory, and this could be a logic zero um, for this, low resistance state. So then, um, they, they were trying to figure out how to do this. How do you switch it from a zero to one to store data? And the second thing is, how do you know which state it's in, the high resistance state or the low resistance state? Well, it's pretty easy to figure out if you're in the high resistance state or the low resistance state um, by measuring its resistance, but how do you switch it from one to the other? How do you switch this kind of free, this free layer here? And you do that, um, well, the first thing they tried was, well, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna put a whole lot of these little uh, magnetic tunnel junctions and I'm gonna put a wire on the bottom and wires on the top. And then by running, by running current through these wires, you can create a magnetic field and say, if you can create a magnetic field on just this one alone, then, uh, then you, can, you can set it, set it to one, one state. Now that's, you know, creating a magnetic field with a wire is not the greatest way to, to do this. And they found out that they couldn't, um, uh, that wasn't, wasn't a very good way to do it. So then they, then they came off with, with something else called a spin transfer torque memory. Um, and it switches by cur running current through this. And they're, they're actually making these, these devices right now. So what, what, you, what you're doing is uh, it's just running a current. If you run a current through one direction, you, f you you cause the storage layer to be in one, one direction. And if you run the current in the other direction, you cause it to flip and go, go around to the other, the other direction. So simply by running a current through it, you can flip it from, from one, one state to another. So then you can, that's how you can, you can store, um, you, can, you can change the bit from zero to one. And then if you use a smaller current running through it, you can measure its resistance. So then if you know it's in a, a um, high resistance state or a, or a low resistance state, so then you, know, then you measure it and you can read it to see if it's in uh, a, a zero or one state. Okay, so they're, they're making these things, but you have to make them out of magnetic materials and they're, they're difficult to make. And, and when you realize that Trans that silicon transistors have been around for a long, long time. So the technology is, is so far ahead with silicon electronics. So when you're trying to make something like this with magnetic properties, um, it's, you know, it takes a long time for the um, technology to, um, to get, e get even or surpass another, another type of techno technology that's been around for a, a much longer time. I mean, here, here's an example where you have <clears throat> lower resistance state, higher resistance state, and here the, here the resistance goes up a factor, almost a factor of three here. And here's the current that they apply to it. So when you, there's no scale on this, but when you apply, say this value of current, then you go up to this state. And then if you apply this amount of current in the other direction, you go, you go say to this state, okay? 
I mean, you can, you can, you can buy these things. They, they make them, but they're, they're more expensive. Okay, any, any questions on those kind of memories? Okay, let's take a, take a look at a couple of future things. Um, topological quantum electronics, okay? We're gonna look at uh, uh, the, the, the quantum properties of electronics and the, 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 the topological aspects of, 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 of it. Okay, in topological um, physics in solid state, um, it turns out that you can you can get electrons that where the the direction of the magnetic moment of the electron is is connected to its momentum. Okay, and I'll, I'll get I'll get that to you. Then essentially you're 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 creating highways for different spin states. And I'll, I'll, let me go through this. So here's here's a typical, one of the first uh, topological insulators, okay? Um, and it has separate highways for spin up and spin down electrons, okay? In other words, the spin direction is locked to the momentum direction. Okay, I'll, um, I'll go over this. So to understand the physics of that, um, you have to understand what the Hall effect is. The say the, here's a normal Hall effect. You'll all be doing this this experiment. Well, some of you will be doing this experiment in uh, the advanced physics lab. It, it's an optional experiment. So um, here's a here's a slab of a conductor. Say it's a sem semiconductor like silicon. Okay, and if you put a if you put a voltage from one end to the other, so you have a current. You, so if you have a positive current flowing down to the left this way, you have electrons flowing up, negative electrons flowing up this way. Okay, and if you have a magnetic field perpendicular up and down like this, then there's a force on the electron that's the velocity cross B. So there's a force on the electron that's perpendicular to velocity and magnetic field. So as the electron tries to move from one end of the sample to the other, there's this force of the magnetic field forcing it to one side. So then you have a buildup of a negative charge here so that you get a voltage and we call that, we call it the Hall voltage, the Hall voltage. Okay, so that's that's the normal Hall effect. Then in uh, 1981, the quantum Hall effect was discovered, and uh, that was another Nobel Prize, that what happens is, is the electrons skip here, they're skipping up, so current is only flowing along the edges of the sample. Okay, there's the center is an insulator, and the uh, So the center is an insulator and the edges are conducting, okay? Because what, what, what somebody did here was they, they took a, a MOSFET and so, so they made a one single layer of electrons on a two dimensional surface. So these electrons now are all, the current moves only along the edges and the middle is an insulator. And then what the topological properties of a topological insulator is that um, you don't need a magnetic field here with a topological insulator. Where here you needed a magnetic field to keep the skipping electrons along the edge. But in a topological uh, insulator, you don't need a magnetic field. And in addition, the, the magnetic field of the electrons in the sample itself are producing the magnetic field. So um, you have, 
if, if electrons are going in one direction, they have one spin. And if they're going the other direction, they have the opposite spin. Very interesting. Let's see if we can share this. How do we do this? How do we do this? Share. I hope you can see this. What is a topological insulator? Let me answer that question in three parts. Let's start with the system which was studied some decades ago, which is a two-dimensional film of electrons with a large magnetic field pointing up through it like this. The interesting thing is that when that field gets very large, the electrons go into a state where they don't conduct electricity in the bulk of the film, but they conduct it around the edge in sort of skipping modes that look like this, and this is called Hall conductance. The interesting thing about these skipping modes is that they are so-called topologically protected. Whatever I do to the edge of the sample, make nicks in it, disorder it, the conduction persists, the mode just deforms to accommodate it. Why is this? Well, it was realized a while ago that it's basically protected in the same way that the hole in the center of a donut is protected. I can change the shape of the donut, I can add bits of dough or take them away, but the hole survives. It's a kind of global property of the thing. And that's topological protection. Now imagine that I could take two of these films and put them right on top of each other, but with one of them experiencing a magnetic field pointing upwards and the other experiencing a field pointing downwards. Then I would have edge modes going one way in the upper film and the other way in the lower film. Um, now, of course, I can't really make this because I can't have two films in the same place experiencing different magnetic fields, but it turns out the electron's own internal spin can act as this magnetic field, and that's what happens in the materials we call topological insulators. So I get an edge mode where the upspin electrons go one way, the downspin electrons go the other, and both are topologically protected. Um, let's go back here. Okay. Um, this, these, these skipping modes, uh, does anyone understand that? Why would the electrons, when you have a current, why would the electrons want to stay against the side of the, of the sample, the edge? I mean, is it because they don't want to be all grouped together? So they like go to the edge because outside of the sheet is not full of electrons? Um, in, in a way, in a way, yes. Um, picture, picture the room you're in right now, okay? And suppose you want to go from one end of the room to the other, but there's a force pushing you to one, one side, one wall, but you're still moving forward, okay? So even, even if you bounce off the wall, there's still something pushing you against the wall again. That's the skip. So you're gonna bounce off the wall and it's gonna push you to the wall again and bounce off the wall and push you to the wall again and it'll do that over and over. And so that's, that's where the skipping mode comes in. Can you picture that? If you picture yourself in the room trying to get from one end to the other? Yeah. Okay.
And so, so all the electrons flow along the edge. Okay, in that, that respect. Uh, here's something that here's something that uh, we worked on we worked on here in, in my lab. Um, here's an apparatus. Uh, you can see uh, it's an ultra high vacuum uh, apparatus that essentially makes thin films. And we were able to make some some thin films in there, and then uh, in collaboration with the, uh, MIT, um, they they made they made some special films that we couldn't even that we couldn't even make here so we um we we published something called the quantum anomalous hall effect and that showed that you could get nearly res zero resistance um, in in one of these topological insulators and the reason is if, if you look up here in this uh um this uh, this 2D slab up here, that suppose you have electrons that are spin up and say they can only move in one direction. Okay. And now there's, there, there's the topological property is such that electrons pointing up have to move in one direction. Uh, electrons pointing down have to move in the other direction. Remember, you can only have two directions for the magnetic moment of the electron, um, essentially the Z component. And uh, so if, if um, re what does resistance mean? Resistance means that if you put a voltage, um, say on, on the bottom here and the top here, you put a voltage potential difference across here that you're going to force an electron to move in one direction, right? And if it gets there without hitting anything, it has essentially zero resistance, but it, we don't have zero resistance except in superconductors. So the electron scatters, like even if, even if you go a millimeter in a, in a normal sample, you're going to scatter, you know, millions of times before you get from one end uh, to, you know, to go a millimeter, you're going to scatter a huge number of times. So scattering is what causes resistance. It just says I'm trying to go from one end to the other, but that when I, when I bump into something, it sends me sideways or backwards. So that causes, that, that causes resistance, that you're impeded from easily getting um, from one, one place to another place. Okay, so that's, that's essentially what resistance is, is just scattering, scattering of electrons off of impurities and things. Um, so if an electron is moving along this side here in a topological insulator, if, if you have an impurity here, um, okay, it has to be, the electron has to be in the highway, right? But if there's an impurity, it can go around it. It can go simply go around it. It can't go backwards because if it goes backwards, it has to flip its spin. And if it's a non-magnetic impurity, there's nothing that can give it the change in angular momentum. So it can't flip its spin. So you can get a you can get a nearly res zero resistance state in a in a topological insulator like this. So it's what I call a superconducting light, like it's, it's not a superconductor. Superconductivity is a very special, a very special thing. But this is just a very low resistance state, kind of like superconductivity. But it, you don't have to have superconducting temperatures for it. Okay. Okay, so anyway, this this is what we published here, and what this what this article is about is the, you know, in a topological insulator, how you can get how you can get a resistance that's very very small, very small. Mind you, we haven't found a way for it to be practical yet. Okay, that's another issue.
Okay, we're coming near the near the end here. It's been about an hour. Um, the spin FET. So you can make a, I just wanted to point out that you can make a transistor that works on the spin effect. You can make an FET basically. I, I won't go over that except um, this was imagined uh, 30 years ago, but nobody's been able to make a good one. So, so we don't, we don't have this, we haven't made a good uh, spin, spin FET yet but we're hoping for it. I mean, when you, when you think about trying to make a transistor or you know, some, some sort of logic device, um, you're always going to have resistance of some kind. And if you're transmitting charge, charge always has some resistance usually. I mean, I showed you in the last slide that we're trying to get rid of resistance, but Usually it has resistance whenever we're trying to move charge. That's one thing. But to, re, but to move spin information takes less energy. That is, you're you know, the magnetic field is changing, but you're not physically moving charge. Like if, if, if you imagined, so uh, imagine the electrons here in the upper, um, the upper figure here, you have you have a couple of you have all these electrons that are that are lined up. Okay, you can you can without moving the charges, you can you can take one of these and you can you can move it over like this in the bottom. You can you can tilt it, and the next one is going to feel that, and that takes less energy to change the magnetic magnetic part of it without changing the, uh, the charge, without moving the charge. So um, spintronics has, can be orders of magnitude less, um, can, ha can have less en energy requirements. So that's, that, that's one of the goals that, you know, it's pretty hard to get to, but we're, we're, we're trying to get there. We're trying to get there. Uh, any questions on on these kind of uh, quantum effects with spin? Like I say again, silicon electronics is so far ahead and has been going along for so long that to you know, to, to make materials with layers of different kinds of materials is, it's, uh, it's daunting. But we're going to come up against, uh, you know, Moore's law eventually that you can't make, you can't make transistors and memories below a certain size that you just, when you get down to a few atoms, the thermal energy is just going to, uh, destroy magnetic moments. So we're gonna, we're gonna, we're, get, we're getting there in your lifetime. Okay, a couple things. What do we do next? Quantum computers, is that the answer? Okay, I'm, I, I'm not an expert in, in quantum computers, but I just, I just um, put, put some things down for, for you to look at. Um, what is a quantum computer? What is a qubit? What, are, what, what is a quantum computer good for? Okay, right now the research in quantum computers, um, you, have, you have these devices it's called a dilution refrigerator that uh, keeps the temperature below one degree Kelvin and it has all these wires in it. All these wires in it and it, it's, uh, it's very expensive and uh, 
it's 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 uh, it's quite a feat. It's quite a feat in, in technology. <laughs> um, so they're connected by hundreds hundreds of wires and number of quantum computers, um, and some 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 of these research um, companies have you know they they have maybe five or ten of these things all working <laughs> working it simultaneously to, to to iron iron out all the bugs here's the actual device the device is a little thing that's kind of like your you know the size of you know not that much bigger than the uh, microprocessor in, in your computer okay so uh, <clears throat> Quantum computer relies on qubits. I think most of you know, know, know about this thing. But anyway, yeah, you have to have a two-state quantum mechanical system. And one of the obvious things is the electron. The electron is a, you know, spin up, spin down, two-state mechanical system. Also, a photon, whether it's uh, the photon is right circular polarization or left circular polarization, that's also a quantum state. Um, it can be at two states, two states at once. It's called superposition. And it's not like uh, classical, classical physics where you, know, you can measure something. Whenever, whenever you measure a quantum state, you, you, you change its state. And when you, when you can couple a couple of these things together, you have entanglement. And you can have, um, they're not connected by by wires. They're connected by their um, their quantum mechanical properties. And in, if if you have if you have entangled qubits, um, and you can move them far apart, uh, Einstein called this spooky action at a distance. That if you if you have these qubits that are entangled and you separate them far apart, if you measure one of them, then you automatically know what the other one is. So, I mean, there's some experiments like sending up information up uh, on a satellite and be, being able to do this experiment where, where uh, you can measure something uh, that's, that's far away from quantum entanglement. Oh, it's spooky, very spooky. Um, there are all these different companies, uh, Google, IBM, Microsoft, Intel, they're always putting a, they're putting a lot of money into uh, quantum computers. But okay, well, what are they good for? Um, well, there's, 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 they're going to be very useful for in, encrypting information. And now, you know, the world relies on information in the speed of, of being able to transmit information very quickly. So encrypting, encrypting it so other people can't read it is, is going to be very important. But there, there, there are two well-known examples, well, only two, um, of, um, of things that you can do with these quantum computers other than encrypting. Um, you, can, you can factorize a number and and uh, there's uh, and you can also you can also do searches be able to search a, a table of things to to find something. So there there are two algorithms that can that can be useful for a quantum computer that can do something um, many orders of magnitude faster than you can classically. But all your classical calculations that we're mostly interested in, you can't do with a quantum computer. Uh, and just in closing with the quantum computers, is there there's something like 18 possible systems for quantum computers? You can use semiconductors. You can use a this is a um, a donor, right? A donor in silicon, phosphorus. A phosphorus impurity in silicon, that's just the donor that we talked about. Optics, NMR, so they're using a lot of superconductors right now, what's called Josephson junctions. Lots of Josephson junctions that are tied together. 
Okay, so the very last thing I'd like to point out, I'm certainly not, I'm not an expert in this, but is that, but what are we going to do when, when we need something, something more like our brain, our, our human cognition? Well, what are, what are, you know, are we going to be able to, to, you know, go way beyond this, you know, zeros and ones and even artificial intelligence? Um, well, there's something called neuromorphic computing, and that's trying, it's building, building neural structure, um, like neurons, basically like neurons, and they're doing this with integrated circuits. Um, Intel is one of the companies that's doing that. Anyway, so that's, that's, that's certainly kind of way out in the future, but that, you know, very, very interesting, interesting subject. If you can, if you can, um, you know, so, somehow use, use a structure that kind of looked like a bunch of neurons that are, that are connected where you, you, um, you excite one neuron, that neuron's couple, coupled to a couple others, and you have, you have intrinsic noise in, in the system. So that's, you know, sometimes we don't want noise, but in, in some of these systems, we do want, we do want some uncertainty and randomness. Uh, and anyway, do you have any final questions? I have a question relating to the project. You yeah. said that we want to assume that they don't know everything. It's like, what scale are we assuming that they know? Like, do they know how an AND gate operates? Like, do they know what it's supposed to output and things like that? Or do we need to explain those? And, and, oh, so um, what, sir, what, what would you be building? Uh, I'm building, a, what is it? Exponentiation, uh, it's A to the B mod P. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, I remember. And so, like, can I assume that like they know what an AND gate does, or should I explain AND gates and OR gates and XOR gates and things uh, like that? Well, that's a good. That's a good question because your audience could. <laughs> yeah, you have to kind of assume an audience of of, of some kind. Uh, yeah, I mean, since it's something, something's, you're doing something simple mathematically in, in it. Yeah, I think it, would, it might be a good idea to, to explain that. I mean, everybody knows what addition, multiplication, even an, an exponent is to some extent. Yeah. I wouldn't spend much time on it though, yeah. Any other questions? Question? I don't have any questions, Professor, but I just wanted to say thank you. Okay, well, I, I won't be seeing anybody face to face after this, except uh, if you're taking uh, advanced physics lab uh, in summer, summer one, then I'll probably see you then. But other, otherwise, we can certainly communicate by, by email. Um, I prefer email over going through Canvas. Okay. Um, so, if, so that that's so that that's what I would prefer. So when you have any questions, email me. Yeah, yeah. And if you want to set up a Zoom time before the before the end, we can we could also do that too. I will not be around tomorrow though. Yeah. Uh, professor, someone has a question in the chat. Yeah, I didn't turn. Let's see, didn't turn the chat on here. Chat. Okay. PowerPoint poggers. 
Okay. <laughs> uh, well, let's let's keep it. Let's just, let's just keep it fairly simple. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Over and out. Good luck. Take care. Have a good day, Professor. Okay. Bye bye. Have a good one, Professor. Yeah. Thanks, Professor. Have a good one. Thank you. Have a good one. Okay. Um, Professor, can I ask yeah. a question? Um, so I was working on a three-bit multiplayer with NAND gate, and then I was wondering, like, how can I set the input? So in my understanding, the input will be three-bit um, binary. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I, I, I can't quite. Um... Oh, sorry. Um, give me one second. Okay. How about right now? Okay. Can you hear me? Okay, three bit multiplier with NAND. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, Talking and then, the, yeah, yeah I, I was wondering how can I um, set the input as binary numbers on yeah. Simulink? Yeah, you're struggling with the input. So um, you should have some sort of visual thing something visual where you can see, you know, what, um, what, what the three bits are that are coming into it and mm -hmm. what the four bits are coming out of it. You should have something that, you know, lights up or does something like that. And then somehow if you can get a pick, if you, well, Wait, so the um, the input's supposed to be like any random numbers um, or yeah. just binary number, zero, one? Yeah, yeah, so you're gonna have, you're gonna have three bits, uh, you know, A, B, and C, and then you're gonna have two of those, mm -hmm. uh, A1, B1, C1, and then you're gonna have A2, B2, C2. Those, those are the two three-bit numbers that you're gonna multiply together and, and come off with a you know four bit number a b c d oh so the up is supposed to be four bit yeah yeah i actually um made a circuit only for um, binary numbers so like mm. if is that is that acceptable um, like uh, the output became um Six bit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm whatever. Whatever it is. Okay. So if you have, um, so one num one input number can be from zero to seven, right? Oh no, zero and one. Well, no. I mean, uh, each, each bit is zero to one, but the the number you the three bit number you're going to have can be. Oh yeah yeah yeah. From zero to seven. So seven times mm -hmm. seven would be. 49 so then you'd need how many bits of information would you of output would you need to represent you know 49 uh, well I need a piece of paper and pen <laughs> but yeah I, I got it yeah yeah okay Thank so you, you. Need, uh, you need the eights column you need the sixteenths column and you need the you need the thirty-two. The thirty-two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, my question was: mm -hmm. I was using um, constant block to produce the um, input number. I mean, yeah. the input. But then I couldn't do that. Like, do I need to use like any converter from um, the decimal to binary, or like, is there any way that I can convert to binary number? Um, so you, you want, you want to convert that to a, uh, digital? No, to binary. To binary. Cause I made a, I made a sort, oh, wait, actually I can email you with my, um, circuit. That would be better. Yeah. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Um, well, I don't know. I did are you still clear on that? And uh, not really, <laughs> honestly. No, okay, not really. okay, so so all you have to do is show that if you put in, um, you know, one zero one, and you multiply that mm -hmm. times zero one one, um, mm -hmm. you know what would what would the output be? Um, zero okay. one zero. Zero one one. Yeah, I mean, it just just take. You only have to do one one example to to show that it works. I uh, know. I mean, um, I made a circuit already, yeah. and then I haven't done the input part because I wasn't sure how to um, convert this model to binary or just in, just generate binary number any three bit binary number on Simulink, mm -hmm. like. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, okay, so, so, so do this. Okay, so if you, if you wanted to, you just need to do one example. Okay, so take... Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, you don't need to do everything. Yeah, just take the number, like the number six, the, oh. decimal, the um, decimal number six, whatever it is in binary, mm -hmm. and um, the number seven in binary, and then, you know, what would you get for the output in, in, in binary? Oh, 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 thank you very much. I thought yeah. I have to generate random numbers. Yeah, just, just show, <laughs> show by one example that it, that it works, okay? Yeah, thank you very much. And then I have one more question. Sorry, sure. um, I keep asking many questions. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, I'm thinking to create one more circuit. Right now I'm using only NAND gates. And then if I um, compare the total time processing um, between the NAND gates and only NAND gate circuit and like several other circuits, is that also possible as a final project idea? To, to, um, okay, so, so you, you, you've, already made, you've already made the circuit using AND gates? Only NAND gate. Only NAND gates. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not asking for. I mean, that's kind. Of, that's kind of the minimum that, that we should ask for. But you know, some some students are doing some things. You know, much more complex just because they they want to do that. Yeah, they want the mm -hmm. experience. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I really enjoy this course. This okay. Semester. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Bye.